Welcome to Level Up Africa. We're going to talk about how to get a job in Unity game development. So here in this video, we're going to do brief introductions about ourselves. Then we're going to talk about the purpose, the people, and the process around getting a job in Unity. So I organized it in a particular way, and we're going to step through it and learn a little bit more as we go. So first with introductions, I'm Sam. I'm a Unity game developer certified in Unity, and I have over 20 years of game dev experience. I am the Beast uh, professional gamer. They call me Brad the Beast, professional gamer from Kenya. Uh, but I've just moved, I've moved from professional gaming to gaming ambassadorship, gaming influencer. If you're talking about gaming, I'm it. And my mission is to colonize Africa with gaming. Nice. Yeah. Okay, the Level Up Africa program is just me in my digital nomad life, journeying through Africa, exchanging ideas with locals, creating projects like this video series, and just learning as I go, and I'm having fun. So each of the videos that we cover all point to the same project that you can download. Unity is a free tool, so if you're interested and inspired about what we're talking about here, you can download through the link below and play along. So first, let's talk about the purpose. Now, when you're looking at what you want to do in your life, a big part of that is what your career is. So there's a concept that I like to talk about around this that's called ikigai, comes from a Japanese word. Brian, do you have any idea what ikigai means? I would pretend to because I watch a lot of anime, but I will let you explain. Okay, so he probably knows, but he's going to pretend he doesn't. So it's Japanese for the reason for being. So you can imagine when you're thinking about what you want to do in your life, including picking a career, having a good idea of what your reason for being could be important. So some of the concepts in Ikigai are, well, what are the things that you can get paid for in life? And what are you good at? You hope that you can be paid for it and you're good. Uh, what are the things you love? So where are you passionate in your idea? Can you also bring that into your career? And then finally, what does the world need? So we'll take a look at this really cool Ikigai diagram and I'll kind of go around. So the outer circles are those four questions you can ask yourself. So if you, for example, pick a job only based on what, you're paid, what you can be paid for, as many of us do, and you're perhaps good at it, then that section, you could call it your profession. But if you can also bring in some of the passion of what you love and bring in what the world needs, creating a mission, all four of those together, you know that you've reached kind of a harmonious mission in your life if it ticks all these boxes. So for many game developers, they begin with a passion for playing games. So probably the, the love angle is there. And as we'll see in this series, the industry of working in video games is huge and it's growing year over year. So there's also an opportunity to get paid for it. So one of the things that we'll talk about here is how you can get good at this industry and what are the types of jobs that you can do. Um, and then also talking about what the world needs. So I'm a passionate educator. And that's an angle in gaming that I really like because I can see the benefits for users. So, Brian, what are some of the things that you think the community needs here? And how does gaming help you bring that to them? Uh, I will take my life, for example. Uh, a lot of my education was done through video games. As I was giving you an example earlier that I learned to speak English properly from video games. Like, uh, indirectly, video games were like school for me. Uh, for a, uh, playing a mission, you get a word, they tell you, we need you to go and conjure something to pass through this gate. And in school, you haven't been taught that word and you have to go back to the dictionary and look at what that means. And then you go and find, oh, so this means to do this. So you go back to the game. So you, you find in a way the game was sending me back to the books without directly mm -hmm. sending me back to the book. And it made me use my mind more. And uh, in terms, like, if we look at the, what do you call it, the benefits of gaming, you'll find... 
we react faster, we see many things happening at once compared to people. And this, I feel, are uh, some positive things about video games that can really impact the community and help it grow. Very cool, very yeah. cool. So we'll continue this series and we'll keep thinking about these different areas. Like, what are we passionate about with gaming? What are some of the uses of games that really bring and deliver on the needs of the world through education, as Brian mentioned, and I mentioned as well. It's something we're both interested in. So now let's talk about the people that you can meet in different job roles in Unity. So first of all, let's take a step back. So Unity is a game engine that helps you create games. Games are a type of software. And the software development lifecycle, as it's called, talks about all the process of making a game from it first figuring out what does it need to be, then maybe getting some paper out and planning what it is, then designing the different features. You may be using Photoshop or Maya to create 2D and 3D assets. Unity really comes in in the development, testing, and deployment, those later phases. So after you've got your idea and your plan done and you sit down to develop the game itself, Unity is where you can begin doing prototyping of simple game ideas, just using simple shapes and squares to communicate your idea and figure out if it's fun. Then after that project matures, you spend a long time in the development cycle, you wanna be doing testing in it. So sharing it with Prapel, getting feedback from it. There's also some automated testing you can do so that you're sure that your code works and doesn't have bugs. And then finally you deploy it. So in the case of Unity, you can deploy to mobile, uh, iOS, Android, you can do computer, so Linux, uh, Windows, Mac, you can release on Steam that plays on those platforms. You can also do all the consoles, VR, you can deploy it anywhere. So in theory, if you design your project right, you can deploy it in all those platforms from the exact same code base. So it's a really nice way for you to uh, take your work and make it uh, used in a lot of different spots. So along the way, when you're sitting down as a game developer and you're working, one of the approaches that people use in game development is called agile software development. And basically, it works like this. Instead of the team saying, oh, we want to create Mortal Kombat, we've all played it, we know what it is, so everyone go do 12 months of work and we'll meet back here in a year, you instead want to make very small goals. These are called sprints. Typically in game dev, you do every two weeks. Your team just says, all right, if we wanna make Mortal Kombat, what's the first thing we need to do? How much can we deliver in two weeks? Now, obviously for a big project, that's gonna be a small bit, but you meet back in two weeks, you make sure everyone's work effort clicks together, and then you decide what should we do for the next two weeks? So maybe you've got some basic characters, then you've got some basic combat, then you bring in the sound graphics and effects, the project matures that way. Cool? Cool. So another key part of being on a game development team and working in that agile process is called the daily standup. Now this is probably the only meeting you need to have in a game dev team. So it's called a standup because typically the team literally stands up in order to keep it light and quick. Each person talks for about 30 seconds and they just answer the same three questions. All teams everywhere in the world working in games answer, well, what did I do yesterday? In the case of the Mortal Kombat game, I could say, okay, I, I used Maya to 3D model my character. What am I gonna do today? I'm gonna bring that character into Unity. You'd explain a bit about that. And then is anything blocking my work? Now, if you're working on a team of five or six people and everyone goes through and answers those simple questions, you're able to continue to work independently where you're being clear about what you did, what you're gonna do. And then and most importantly, if I'm blocked by someone else's work, it's just a nice moment to coordinate on that so that everyone can work without any delays. Cool? Cool. So let's talk about some of the game development professionals. I think, professions, sorry. I think most people think you have to be a programmer and that's the only type of job in gaming but there's so many different types of jobs. And as big as the industry is, the number of different roles you can have is expanding. So a very popular category is game development. I put a little star next to that. That's people who are the programmers that I mentioned. 
There's also game designers. Now, game designers don't necessarily code at all. They could, but they sit down and de decide what are the mechanics that our game should have? Which different existing games that they like can they bring together as inspiration to create some new experience? Then, of course, there's all sorts of different art disciplines as well. The list continues, and we see some things that I was reminded about Brian's experience. There's competitive gaming, which we see here includes things like coaching, performance, and obviously playing the games as well, organizing events around the gaming industry, and then also marketing, you know, bringing together sponsors and brands into those events. So Brian, could you talk for a minute about a couple of the things that you do that you see here on the screen? Uh, so the first star is uh, on competitive gaming and on competitive gaming there is a lot going on so initially for me i used to get my coaching from youtube i go and watch professional other professional gamers gaming and try and take some i wouldn't say copy but copy some of their style and incorporate it into my gaming style or sometimes i just went all out and played as they did number two i realized something and uh, this is something that gave me an advantage when it came to professional gaming fitness really mattered yeah, because I realized people were getting tired. So in most tournaments that I won, I was coming from the loser side. So I lost my first game. But by the time the tournament is coming near its completion, the guys are already tired. But because I have endurance and fitness in my mind, I'm still good to go. So I was winning. Uh, number two, we go to events. I've done a lot of events, use them for experiments like the one I showed you. We were going on this public transport, having gaming, going to events, doing stuff like Just Dance, doing FIFA tournaments and events. I've tried it out and I was like, oh, this is also another world that I can fit in as a gamer. And then last but not least, the marketing part of it, which is the last part that has been kind of uh, technical for me. So I am more of a hands-on guy. I'm, I'm into the action. I'm just like, give me and point me in that direction. I'll do the most. But when nice. it comes to writing down, I find it a bit challenging because uh, of other reasons. But yeah. For sure. Yeah. What are the types of games that you see popular here in Kenya for competition? Uh, number one. Without even without even FIFA, FIFA soccer, okay. Africans and football are inseparable. <laughs> like everywhere you go, I assure you, people don't even know what they are gaming on. But it has football; they can game. That is number one. And then the other titles follow through. So we have uh, fighting games like Tekken, Mortal Kombat. Now we have Street Fighter. If you go to mobile, we have the likes of PUBG. We have the likes of Call of Duty Mobile. And the list is growing more because we have more and more information flowing to people now. Like people have access to TikTok, Instagram, YouTube. So people are seeing these different games and trying them out. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And why, when I think of competitive gaming, I'm not a big in that uh, industry. I always think of fir like first-person shooter games on PC. Yeah. Why isn't that on your list? Why isn't that on my list? So a lot of gaming that happens in Africa, I'll be honest, is uh, you, you see the price of a PC? <laughs> a lot of people who I know have PCs that are capable for gaming don't use them for gaming first. They use them for work. Right. And then the other option is, oh, maybe I game. I have a couple of games, but I use this for work. So you find in our culture of growing here in Africa, it was in gaming devs. Like you'd find a few select who are capable of even importing and having the machines at home. So it's a number, like you can count people who have consoles at home. But for us, the access was easy when going to gaming launches. And the gaming lodge guys don't bother themselves. They know people like football, so you'll find one, uh, like 64 uh, copies of FIFA, one copy of Mortal Kombat, and those others, just to, you know, make you guys feel like you're, you're, you're welcome. For but sure. the number one game was FIFA mostly, so you find a lot of people in gaming dance, and our competition arises from gaming dance. So now I'm trying to move that to also have these guys who have PCs, who have their mobile so i'm trying to do tournaments all across uh, when i work together with pro series gaming i do tournaments on mobile i do tournaments on console i do tournaments on pc but as a guarantee any console tournament especially if it's fifa you'll have numbers pc it's a struggle because again i said a lot of people can't afford a proper pc yeah. for gaming so they don't invest that much to be fps players it sounds good i get i get what you're saying yeah. so some of the other jobs that are on here before we move off Another popular one under broadcasting would be to stream games. Yes. So that's popular around the world as well. 
I, I, have, I have a point of that. Mm-hmm. Streaming in Africa is a problem. You know mm. why? Why? We are, we are divided mm. in terms of language. That's a very good point. <laughs> yeah, we are divided in terms of language. So talk so, a bit about language in Kenya. If you were a streamer, what possible languages would you stream in? I'd have to mix Kiswahili, which is our national language, together with English. Mm-hmm. And then that now just limits my content to move around Kenya. It's true. It can move around East Africa, but in Uganda, they speak, some parts of it speak English, some parts of it try to understand Kiswahili, they don't. <laughs> and then Tanzania, they fully speak Kiswahili, and then English is, uh, you know? So you find even just moving your content around East Africa, which is one mm. block, is a problem. Mm. So you can imagine you want your content to hit the whole of Africa. Yeah. So you have to look at the slangs. And remember, as we have slangs, everywhere there is a slang. You go to Tanzania, they have their slang. Have, everywhere in Africa, there is slang. So you find it's really hard to create content to push it out just more than Kenya. I get but that. But I think as we go, we'll find a way to overcome that. So that's what I'm here for as well. Sounds good. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. yeah, it's something in the English-speaking world we take for granted that we can stream and consume and create media in English. All across. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so let's talk a bit about all those different roles. What, which ones are the most common? So I decided to approach this because games are often created by very small teams, indie game devs, they call them, independent teams, who hope they can create a project, perhaps without any funding, and then move into selling that project after it's partially complete. So let's imagine you're a team of one. You're a solo developer. What are those skills that you're probably going to need? I'd say the single most important one is being a game programmer. So that's someone that brings together various skills, but of course there needs to be code being written. You can't, you know, skip that particular part. If you're a team of about three, and that's a very common team size for an indie project, you'll have a game programmer, an artist of some type or types, and then the game designer probably comes in there as a dedicated role. Again, the game designer is probably not doing any coding. The artist is just creating the visuals. And then the game programmer is bringing those concepts together with the, uh, the art assets. I've worked on teams that are 15 people in size on the same project. So, of course, you'd hit all of those. I'd say you'd have half of the 15 being game programmers of different types and disciplines. The other half would be some artists, some game designers, and then project managers. Project managers are the ones that help everyone communicate, doing that stand-up meeting that I mentioned, making sure that everyone's working efficiently. And then, of course, a very popular way to get into the game industry is being a game tester. So that QA or tester role that I mentioned here is only really part of a dedicated team when the team gets quite large. Uh, The smaller the team you are, the more that you just do all of those hats as one or three people. Cool? So let's talk a bit about the process here. So we mentioned before when you're finding your purpose and how you want to find a job that makes you really happy and fulfilling in your life, you think about what are the things I can get paid for? What are the things I'm good at? What do I love to do? And then what does the world need? Like making games for people to have fun with, that fulfills a fantastic need. Working in education is another fantastic way to bring gaming into people's hands and getting some of those needs met. The important thing here when you're getting into gaming, regardless of which position you want to seek out, artist, programmer, game designer, is just practice it. A lot of people say, how do I get into a game team and make a game? I say, first, be a team of one or three with some friends and start making games. Start simple Use the resources that we'll cover in this series and also things you can find online and learn how to make games. Just practice by doing, right? Start small. Try and make things like Pac-Man or like Asteroids, these classic old games. And look at those because they have some simple mechanics that are easier as a starting game developer to, to work on. So... After you build those skills or as you're building those skills, you want to have some sort of digital presence so people can find you if you're a new game developer, game artist, game designer. So I'll include links below to all of what I'm about to show here. But some of the highlights are having a resume that lists your experience, 
resume or CV, depending where in your world, you might call it different things. Then having a portfolio. So you can take a look at my, my work history here. I'll have it linked below, but you wanna have some demonstration of the one, two or three simple games that you've done already. So you can show somebody that you've got some skills there and demonstrate it so they wanna hire you. Then a really big part, it's also how Brian and I found each other is LinkedIn. So that's a professional networking site. It's one of many, but it seems to be the most popular one out there. And this brings together all of your different uh, skills and experience so someone can find you and see more about you. So I created a template to be an example of how a game designer or game developer would want to list their very first um, ex experiences. And I called that template Tim Plate. So this picture here is actually from a real link I'll link below and you can take a look at it. It's a fictitious example of how a first year game developer would wanna put the little bit of experience they've got, but present it in a nice clean way so they can get that first job. So that's another resource you can take a look at. Then I have a link below for advice on getting into game development. I have a couple other videos that cover some of the basics on what does the interview process look like as a game developer? How would you wanna get into and prepare for those interviews? Some types of software development have very scary, hard interview processes, particularly if you wanna be like a backend developer for Google or Facebook or Apple. They're notorious for having really hard interviews. As a game developer, it's not typically that aspect that's challenging. It's creating a nice portfolio, being able to communicate about your work nicely in the one hour interview so people get a good impression of what you can do. Then lastly is applying. So when you're applying for jobs, you can find them listed on LinkedIn, on Indeed, on Monster.com, on ones local to your area, but you wanna be applying a lot. It's a volume game, especially when you're starting out in the game development industry. I've been a mentor for people getting their first jobs in gaming, and you need to put out dozens of nice applications in order to get some responses back. It is a competitive industry, but if you stay at it, you'll get those responses, get some interviews and gain that experience. So when you're looking at getting your first job in the industry, some things that I think are important is one, to be flexible about exactly the job role responsibilities and the types of games you're gonna work on. If you're a diehard Mortal Kombat fan and you only wanna program those kinds of games, you might not find that in your very first role. So be flexible that you'd work on a first person shooter or a mobile game or do UI versus gameplay development. The real important thing is to find a team where you're able to learn. So that's a key question to ask as you're interviewing is, are there opportunities here for me to learn? Because that's what you want to do, right? Yeah. So now that's the recap of the section. So Brian, what are some of the things that you thought were interesting when we talked about the, the icky guy finding your purpose, the different job roles, yeah. and then the process as well? Uh, like it really hit home because uh, I realized after a while I had when I got the name Beast, people were afraid to even come to tournaments when I was there. Somebody would say, oh, Beast is going for the tournament, so I won't go. So I started to look at how do I better fit myself in the industry if I'm not pro gaming, but I'm still doing something I love. So I tried to look at the different angles and I realized, oh, I could do mentorship, I could do the tournament organization. And those are the things you pointed out, yeah. which really made me happy. So uh, let's just say I'm at peace knowing that as a gamer, I'm not just limited to playing video games. I can try, organize, market, and also venture into game development, which is what we are discussing now. Excellent. Yeah. I'd say not just in gaming, but in the professional work oh. industry now, having a lot of different skills in different areas is increasingly important. You know, during our parents' and grandparents' age, the idea was you'd get one job and you'd stay there for 50 years. That doesn't happen anymore. You're gonna change jobs quite a bit, and having different skills in different areas will help you do that over your career. Yeah. All right, thanks, that's it for this video.